What an awesome update on what the Lord's doing all around the world. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, like Pastor Mike said, I, my name is Nate Mortensen. My wife, Corey, and I and our kids, we serve in Honduras as part of Team Honduras um, alongside the Goins family. And uh, like Pastor Mike said, we were here a part of West Florida Baptist Church. Um, Corey and I both surrendered to the Lord's will for our lives prior to joining church, prior the church here, prior to getting married. And uh, for the first 11 years of our marriage, God's will for our life was that we be planted right here, that we be involved in what he was doing right here at West Florida Baptist Church. Like it was mentioned, I was a Scambia County deputy for about 10 years, and we were just faithfully serving and, and excited to be a part of what God was doing here at West Florida Baptist Church. God then took a change in our lives and moved us to Honduras. But missions, we're in Missions Emphasis Sunday. Missions is taking the good news of the gospel to the entire world. And we can't ever forget that the world starts right outside those doors. And so the mission field is right here. The mission field is also to the extremes, to the ends of the world. And we have a responsibility to not neglect either end of that spectrum, but to be involved in taking the good news of the gospel to, to the entire world. So Corey and I really feel like in a lot of ways we are still a part of what God is doing here at West Florida Baptist Church. Yes, we've changed our location and we're now in Honduras, but it's exciting to be a part of what God's doing there and here all at the same time. And it's really encouraging every time we're back to be able to see what God is doing here in and through you all. The giving of this church is awesome and it's exciting to be a part of that giving as well. So we're going to jump into the message this morning. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, we're going to read some familiar verses. Um, I would say that in a church just like our church, West Florida Baptist Church, we probably do not need a Missions Emphasis Sunday so that we can get teaching on what missions is. We understand what missions is. But we need an Emphasis Sunday. We need times like this to be re-energized to be challenged, to be encouraged, to keep on keeping on, to be faithful. And so this morning, we're going to look at some familiar verses. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, uh, the Bible says in uh, verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we can spend around your word. Uh, thank you for this time that we can enter into your presence and worship you. I uh, thank you for the privilege it is to be partnered together for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would help us this morning. I pray that you would help me to um, speak clearly and to be an encouragement this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, these are familiar verses. Maybe you even have these verses memorized because they're so familiar. But the, the Great Commission, just because it's familiar, doesn't mean we don't need reminded about it on a constant basis. Doesn't mean we don't need that reminder. Uh, like I said, we, we know the Great Commission. We know the natural application. But have you ever noticed that in the, the five places where we receive the Great Commission, the, the four Gospels and the Book of Acts, each one says it just a tiny bit differently? And the Bible uses a little bit different verbiage to help us with an application point, to help us with a, a focal point as we consider the Great Commission. It's a giant task. So if we look at, at Mark 16, 15, uh, Mark's focus is on the preaching of the gospel. If we look at, at Luke, uh, Luke in Luke 24, 47, Luke is trying to help us see all nations. The entire world needs to hear the gospel. John's presentation is personal. Uh, in John chapter 20, verse 21, John's, uh, Jesus says, As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And then Acts uh, 1.8 tells us that we are to testify of our risen Savior. And so we, we have all of these different angle points on the Great Commission, on world evangelism, on the, the getting the gospel to the world. And we just read Mark's uh, account of the Great Commission, and I didn't highlight it right away, but I just want to read a couple of those key words that help us to see the emphasis of Matthew's gospel. Matthew uh, verse, uh, 28, verse 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. And that word teach there uh, and teaching has the idea of discipleship. It has the idea of making more disciples. It has the idea of studying under, becoming a, a student of, being under the tutelage of another. And so really and truly in our modern world, the idea of discipleship is really only a Christian term. And we can get really good at knowing Christian terms, but what's the application? How does this fit in my life? You know, we, we would say, okay, what's discipleship? Well, it's not quite apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is a little bit different. Apprenticeship is learning from a master so that you can become a master in a given trade, to master a skill. Discipleship is more about a whole life perspective. I want to give a, a real quick definition for discipleship because we see it all throughout the New Testament, but it's not specifically defined, this word, other than just the examples that we see. So we're going to look at several of those this morning. But I would say that discipleship is the process through which a disciple of Jesus Christ grows and matures in the faith and is transformed into the image of Christ. Let me say that one more time, just as a, a definition. Discipleship is the process through which a disciple of Jesus Christ grows and matures in the faith and is transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So, discipleship is, is not a class per se, although it can begin with a class, and that's great if it does. I'm sure West Florida has different classes that serve the function of discipleship, but discipleship is not a class. Neither is it a diploma that you get at the end of completing some kind of study. Discipleship is a, a way of life. Discipleship is a process through which a disciple grows and matures into the image of Christ and being transformed into the image of Christ. Like I said, we have multiple examples throughout the New Testament of discipleship in action. And so we're going to look at four words this morning that I think will help us to understand discipleship. I believe that discipleship truly is the method of missions. If we had to have a method about how we're going to accomplish the Great Commission, it would be through discipleship. And so four words this morning. First of all, the word surrender. Surrender. Discipleship begins with surrender, a surrendered heart. Uh, every disciple must surrender to be a disciple of their, their master, their rabbi. Uh, in, in the book of Matthew, if we would go to the beginning of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus, the very beginning of his earthly ministry, he begins calling his disciples. First of all, in Matthew chapter 4, he calls Andrew and Peter, two brothers. Then, just a couple verses later, he calls James and John. And in Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says, and then immediately, both of these brothers left their boats, they were fishermen, left their boats, and followed Jesus. We see a, a visual of their surrendered heart. They were doing their thing, the, the master said, follow me, and they surrendered to follow the master, follow him, to study under him, to become his disciples. And so we see this visual surrender, but this is a, this is a process. And it begins with that surrendered heart. Uh, in, in the 21st century, in our day, we don't see this very often. This is not a, a common idea. But in the first century, it was very normal. Very normal for a rabbi who might preach to many, many different people. And there might be even hundreds, thousands that would be excited to hear from and learn from a, a Jewish rabbi. It was also very normal for that rabbi to call men to follow him and to become his disciples, his students, not just in academic lessons, but learning to live like their master. Uh, I was reading about some uh, examples of discipleship in like first century Israel, and it was kind of funny because there was a talking about how disciples would sometimes pick up the, the manner of speech of their, their rabbi, mimicking the way they talk, uh, imitating the way they talk, even one who had a limp, and all of his disciples had a limp. <laughs> they didn't have a limp because they needed a limp. They were learning to imitate their master. So they were living with, following their, their master. And here we have the beginning. The disciples in, in Matthew chapter number four begin following Jesus. They have surrendered 
to learn from and learn to imitate and be growing in, in him. So this is what we see. Andrew, Peter, James, John, they follow Jesus everywhere um, throughout his three and a half years of ministry, constantly learning from him. Not just in the, the lesson times, but in the, the day-to-day, the walk with God. And it's an encouragement to us to be surrendered to walk with God every single day. We may not be able to literally walk with Jesus like the disciples did. And boy, I, I think that would be an exciting thing to do. But we have the word of God. We can walk with Jesus, reading his word every single day, getting into God's word, allowing him to, to transform our lives through his word. And it can make a, an impact through our surrender. But it takes that surrender. We have to make that decision. No, I'm going to follow Jesus. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you surrendered to him, to follow him, to follow his leading through his word as he grows you and transforms you into the image of of Jesus Christ? That's what surrender is. So discipleship is the method of missions. And the method of missions begins with a surrendered heart, a personal surrendered heart. Word number two this morning, we're moving quickly for time's sake, but word number two, development. I think the development is a key part of discipleship. Really and truly, surrender and development are kind of two sides of the same coin because the disciples surrendered to Jesus. They began to follow Jesus those three and a half years, but for the purpose of development, the purpose of learning, the purpose of growing. And and I think that's a good reminder to us. We see the surrendered hearts of, of many of God's servants in the Bible. But there's always a period of time that is surrender, a period of time that coincides that surrender that is development. God preparing those that are going to serve to, to be used by him. Um, we, 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 we think of discipleship, and we think of surrender, and we think of development, and we want to find some kind of growth path. But if discipleship is being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, it's not going to be a straight line. We have to daily learn to walk with God and be submitted to him and his will. We see a great example of the the development stage in kind of what's not said about the Apostle Paul. Think of the Apostle Paul. We first meet uh, Saul. (laughs) We first meet Saul as he's becoming a believer in Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He has an encounter with Jesus Christ, and his life is transformed. And in that very first moment... We see his surrender. He says, Lord, what would you have me to do? There's that surrendered heart. And the book of Acts moves so quickly that we, we can miss the fact that here he is in Acts chapter 9, and he immediately wants to tell others about what Christ has done for him, about the forgiveness that he's received, about his salvation, about God reaching him. But we pick him up again in chapter 11, and that's so close But really, chapter 9 to chapter 11 is anywhere between 8 and 11 years where he is now a leader in the church. There was a process of development in learning to walk with God. If if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, I pray that you're surrendered to the Lord's will for your life. But I pray that you're surrendered for the purpose of development. You might say, well, I'm in that purpose of development. I need to learn. Uh, A lot of the guys in that video were eager and hungry to learn and grow so that they can be used for God, on purpose being discipled, on purpose being surrendered to be developed, to then be used of God in a greater way. So we have, have the word surrender. We have the word development. How are you doing in those two areas? How are we all doing in those two areas? Are we surrendered? Are we trying to grow in our faith on a daily basis because we are walking with our master through reading his word on a daily basis. Word number three this morning, investment. Discipleship, the method of missions, is investment as well. There's investment in others, a personal investment in the life of somebody else, a personal investment in the spiritual growth of somebody else. Um, We will never arrive as Christians we, we, we are never going to be, in this, in this life, not until heaven, will we truly be transformed into the image of Christ. It's a process of growth, a process of walking with God. But we should get to the point, like the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11:1, 1, be ye followers of me, 
even as I am also of Christ. Uh, it is disciples who make more disciples. And, and as we walk with God, we should be seeking to invest in others, seeking to disciple others, seeking to help others walk with God, seeking to help others grow in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I, I think of examples. Uh, where do we see this investment in others in the New Testament? I think of Barnabas. We were just talking about Paul and his conversion. Barnabas was one that came alongside Paul. Uh, I think of Paul and Barnabas then investing in John Mark when they took him on the first missionary journey. Peter invested heavily in the, the development of Mark as well. Uh, you think of Paul and all of the people that he invested in, whether it be Silas, Titus, Luke. But I think one of the clearest examples of how there's a, an intentional investment in the lives of others is the story of Paul and Timothy. Timothy was a, a young believer when Paul first came and met him. And Paul meets him and, and invites him to come and join them on the missionary journey. Later on in his development, Timothy is sent out on some solo uh, mission trips, as you, uh, if you would say. And then in the end, Timothy is sent to pastor the church in Ephesus. And so Paul was constantly investing in the lives of those around him. I know me personally, I always think of Paul as more of that pioneer missionary, the one who just wanted to get to the places where God had never been known, where Jesus Christ had never been known. He even says that in, in Romans, that his desire is to preach where nobody else had heard, to build on nobody else's foundation. That was his desire. But he didn't miss the point of investing in others as well, in their development as, as disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and Paul and Timothy is a great example of that. You might be saying this morning, well, I'm, I'm surrendered. I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to grow in my faith. I, I want to be developing in my walk with the Lord, but I'm still in that development stage. I, I can't invest in others. May I encourage you? One way you can invest in others is by your encouragement. If you're surrendered, if you're desiring to be developed and to, to grow, invite others to join you in that journey. Be that encouragement. Hey, come with me to, to a Bible study. Come with me. Let's, let's grow together. Let's walk with God together. Each and every one of us can do that much. We can all say, hey, come with me. Follow me as I follow Christ. I might not be the example that you need to follow, but follow me. Let's do this together. And we can all be investing in the development of others. We can't talk about investing without talking about giving also. This is a giving church. But we can invest in what God's doing with very basically, earthly speaking, no real return on our investment right now. It's exciting to see what God's doing in India, is it not? It's exciting to see what God used this church to do. $70,000 is not nothing. That's sacrifice. And so it's exciting to be able to be invested in that. And I encourage you to keep going in that. I don't remember which preacher it was that I first heard say it, but if we're going to be developing, if we're going to be surrendered, if we're going to be walking with God, giving is one of those areas that is the most tangible way to show our faith. It's the most tangible way to walk by faith. We have to give a part of what we have, trusting in faith that God is going to supply for all of our needs, even as we walk by faith. And so let me encourage you, if, you're, if you are giving, keep giving. Keep walking by faith. If you're not giving, find a way to get God. Let God use you and grow your faith through your investment in what he's doing in, in tithes and, and regular offerings here at West Florida Baptist Church. So we've got discipleship, the method of missions. It is a surrendered heart. It's a heart that's ready for development, that desires to grow. And it's a heart that desires to be investing in other people. I said we had four words because we could really wrap it up just right there. But last of all, we have multiplication. Multiplication or, or multiply. The word multiply. Discipleship in its natural process produces more disciples. It, it results in multiplication. Discipleship always results in you investing in others. Somebody investing in you. You investing in others. And then them in turn again investing in others. We've looked at the example of, of Paul and Timothy. And like I said earlier, Timothy was eventually sent to be the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And there in Ephesus, Paul sends him uh, the letters to Timothy. And in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, 
Paul instructs Timothy. Uh, Verse 2 says, And the things that thou hast heard among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Disciples make disciples. There's a natural process of multiplication that takes place. Really, the, the multiplication side of it, whether it's multiplying surrendered hearts, whether it's multiplying hearts ready for development, whether it's multiplying hearts ready to be investing in others, all of those are, are really and truly kind of like a, a, a barometer of the health of a church. Every church should be growing in all of these areas. We should see multiplication in these areas as we minister, as we serve the Lord, as we walk with the Lord as disciples. We should all be growing in these areas. And each faithful disciple should be saying, Lord, how am I doing in each of these areas? The encouragement comes as we see multiplication. Multiplication is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's not our responsibility. But God desires to use us uh, to multiply, to make more disciples. So I just want to challenge you again this morning. How are you doing in your way of missions? Like I said, probably not a need for information. What is missions? But just that challenge to keep on keeping on, keep going, keep serving the Lord, keep growing in your personal walk with the Lord. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We are partners together with the Holy Spirit to advance His kingdom through the method of discipleship. I pray that that would be our heart's cry as individual believers, that we would be surrendered disciples, surrendered to develop and invest in others, and and sit back and watch God do the multiplying.